Welcome to the webinar, Starting a Business in the Netherlands. Starting a business in the Netherlands is an attractive option for foreign entrepreneurs. But how do you go about setting up your business? What do you need to know? Which permits do you need? And what taxes can you expect to pay? Those topics will be discussed by experts and experienced entrepreneurs. Do you have a question? Use the live chat option underneath the video screen to ask our specialists. They will reply directly. If you are a foreign entrepreneur wanting to start a company in the Netherlands, then you will need a residence permit, a work permit, a citizen service number, and of course, accommodation. We're going to discuss what you need to do and how to do it with Willem Drost from Startup Delta and Gulten Shankaya from the Dutch Immigration and Naturalization Service, the IND. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Willem, you work for Startup Delta and you help entrepreneurs to start their businesses here. And how many startups do you help each year? Oh, I see at least 100 startups every year coming from other countries and uh, looking to establish their business in the Netherlands. And, and as a facilitator, as a mentor, help them find their way in the Netherlands and uh, to start a business and grow their business. Perfect. And, well, I'm very curious, you work for the IND. How many permits does the IND provide every year? Well, I don't have the exact numbers, but I can tell you that the Netherlands is number four on the ranking list of the most competitive countries. So, well, we grant thousands of applications based on labor purposes. So that's really quite a lot. Yeah, no, that's a whole lot. Yeah. Oh, and it's also quite complex, of course. So I'd like to use an example to make things a bit clearer. Uh, let's say we have Mr. Singh. And he's from India, and he is a software developer. So he comes from outside the EU, and he wants to start a company here. So how does that work for him? Which route should he take? Well, first of all, I assume that he's going to orientate on the Dutch market. So he can go to the embassy, to the Dutch embassy or the consulate, to gain more information about the uh, opportunities, uh, labor opportunities, business opportunities. And he can also submit an application for a business visa or a visa short stay. So he can travel to the Netherlands uh, with his visa. And if he is in the Netherlands and he start, wants to start a business, he can start up or he can submit an application for a residence permit. Um, the most important part of the residence permit procedure is, and this is the general procedure of the self-employed person procedure, um, that it has an innovative character and it has to have a value for the Dutch economy. So we will request the Netherlands Enterprise Agency um, if, if the business has added value for the Dutch economy as well as an innovative character. The Netherlands, Netherlands Enterprise Agency will well, there are three categories. They will look to the personal experiences of Mr. Singh. This could be education or work experience. If Mr. Singh has a master's degree, he will gain more points instead of a bachelor degree. Uh, the second part is the business plan and with a very good financial plan. So the Netherlands Enterprise Agency will look to the continuity and the solvency of the product or services. So um, the third part is the added value for the Dutch economy. So that means that uh, his service or the business will create employment in the future, as well the innovative character of uh, the service and activities, and also the investments in the future. Okay. So if the Netherlands Enterprise Agency will give a positive advice, we will proceed the application of his residence permit. Perfect, yeah. And how does it work if you want a startup scheme? How does that exactly work? Well, with the startup scheme, it is important that uh, there is an innovative idea. And with the guidance of a facilitator, that's the important part of mm -hmm. the procedure, uh, the facilitator has to guide uh, Mr. Singh to make this innovative idea into a blooming business, a blooming company. So. Willem knows a lot about the facilitating part and uh, also the facilitator helps Mr. Singh by making a step-by-step -step plan mm. and work, work out this innovative idea. Yeah, so it's only about innovative ideas you were just talking about. Well, most of it, yes. Willem can also talk about the facilitating sure. part, of course, I think, sure. and the investment part. 
Yeah, so, so once, they, once they're done with the whole permitting process in, in The Hague, let's say, uh, they will be handed over to a player like Startup Delta. Because now Mr. Sim is going to say, how do you get access to markets? How do you get access to, f to investors? How do you get access to all the networks that are relevant for my business? Uh, how do you get access to, uh, to, to talents? Uh, well, you're, they're already dealing with the Startup Visa. You already heard the story in The Hague. Now it comes to us, how am I going to do business? Mm -hmm. How am I going to find access to markets, to talent, uh, to networks? Uh, if I go to another country, how am I going to do that? Right. So we're connecting, we're facilitating that and uh, telling Perfect. them where to go to start up the business in reality. So you were a big help for them, yes. actually. But I want to go back a bit to the startup Pfizer because yes. um, let's see how you go about getting one of those. For example, in Amsterdam. Are you a startup from outside of Europe? Do you want to settle down in Amsterdam? Start doing business in the startup capital of Western Europe. We present you the Startup Visa, the greatest way to get your boots on the ground in the most exciting startup environment worldwide. The Netherlands has always been and still is a country of entrepreneurs who form the foundation for innovation and job creation. There are multiple criteria to fulfill to qualify for the startup visa. The first requirement for obtaining a startup visa is working together with a facilitator. A facilitator is a business mentor who will support your needs in operational management, marketing, research, and investment acquisition. But how does a facilitator select you? Show your MVP or prototype and prove you are innovative. Send a business plan to the facilitator, including your role in the startup, the idea behind the product or service, how it is innovative, how to transform the idea into a business. Show that the idea is already in progress to improve your chances. If you get selected by the facilitator, you can start your adventure in Amsterdam. You should register at the Dutch Chamber of Commerce. Your facilitator will help you to get the paperwork done. The final requirement includes sufficient financial resources to prove you can pay the expenses of living in the Netherlands for one year. The minimum amount needed is 13,000 euros. Finally, as a startup entrepreneur or an authorized representative, you should apply for a residence permit to the IND. The application for a startup visa must be submitted to the Dutch embassy or consulate in the country of residence. We advise getting professional juridical help to make sure the paperwork is correct. The estimation of processing the startup visa application is seven weeks. And Gilton, where do I apply for a startup visa? Well, in the case of Mr. Singh, I will recommend him just go first to the Dutch embassy to collect a visa if he doesn't have a business visa, for example, or if he's a short stay, to really orientate the Dutch market, know what's going on uh, in the Netherlands. That's really important. And he will have a visa or he, will, uh, he can collect a visa soon if he tells them that it's for the business activities or opportunities. So that's no problem. And, well, I he think... He needs Willem as well. He needs Willem, but first of all, he has to enter the Netherlands, and that's ah. the visa part. So after he enters the Netherlands, he can try to find a facilitator. Mm -hmm. He can check the website of the Netherlands Enterprise Agency. There are reliable, uh, guide, very good facilitators on their website. Probably he can also... Um, well, yeah, there are multiple options. You. Yeah, there are multiple options for that. So, uh, so once they come to the to startup Delta, we we're going to find out. Okay, where do you want to establish your business? Depending in the part of the country you're going to operate. If you're in the Hague, there's it. Okay, then we can recommend that organization as a facilitator. You go to Amsterdam as another organization to operate as a facilitator. And then as a facilitator, we're going to look at: Do they qualify? Are are they somebody that really qualifies for for this startup visa? For instance. Is it a scalable operation? If he's coming to the Netherlands, is this an organization that has the potential to become a major engine for economic growth, a major engine for creating high quality jobs? Those are the things that you're looking at as a facilitator. Once you, once you take all the boxes, you hand them over to The Hague and they, they, they go on with the process of the, of, the, uh, of the permitting. Okay, and who else can help you with immigration matters? 
Well, Immigration Matters is, is basically only IND. It's the IND. And that's the only place to go for true immigration issues, and that's not what a facilitator does. A facilitator looks more at the, at the business aspect of, is this innovative, is this scalable, mm. is this an, an, a company that will really start contributing, contributing to, the, to the Dutch economy. Okay. Then you hand them back over to the IND yeah. uh, once you tick all the boxes. Okay, so if you want to start your business here, so which Dutch organizations do you need to approach? Well, there is multiple. Uh, for instance, in most of the tech regions in the Netherlands, you have big organizations like Brainport in Eindhoven or Innovation Quarter in The Hague. They are organizations that have that are very well connected, not only with the government, but also with the corporates, with all of the networks that you need. And, and that's also why they are providing those facilitated services, because they're all operating as a spider in the web mm. for these companies that want to orientate themselves about opportunities in the Netherlands. And you need to start at the embassy, I think. And there's like a sort of a process is where you have to go? Correct. And, and after that, how does it work step well, by step? Well, that's, that's, that's well, your end of the, the, embassy, the business, yeah. Uh, well, if we have the application for the startup regulation, the residence permit, mm -hmm. of course, he has to collect, uh, if we talk about Mr. Singh, he has to go to the IND front office to collect his residence permit, but before the residence permit, he has to go to the front office for biometrical testing and the pictures as well for preparing the residence card. Mm -hmm. And he has to go to the municipality to re register himself in the municipality where he's going to live. Yes, of course. Uh, afterwards, he has to go, if he has his residence card, he has, to, he has to undergo a TB test because he has Indian nationality. That, that means that he, he has to go to the municipal health service. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Uh, the form is really on our website, so he can download the form on our website. Okay. And you, of course, need to go to the Chamber of Commerce. Well, to written the, his business in the Chamber of Commerce, that's really a must. Yep. And probably the facilitator will help him and guide him by doing that. Mm -hmm. And you need to go to a bank, I presume? Sure. Bank well, you, well, you first start with, with the Chamber of Commerce. Before you do that, you need to figure out, well, what's the legal form that we're going to form? Are we going to be a BV? Is this a single operator? Uh, so you need to make those choices ahead of time before you go to, to the uh, Chamber of Commerce. You need to make all these choices ahead of time. And it's an online process. It can be very quick. And once you make the, the selection, you go to the Chamber of Commerce, then you get your registration. With that, you can go to a bank and you open up a, a business account. Mm. So that's the sequence of operations at that end. Okay. And, well, let's say that Mr. Singh, he has a family in India as well. Will they also all receive a residency permit when they come here? No, well, Mr. Singh is a sponsor for his family, uh, for his spouse or partner or even the children. So he has to submit an application for his family members. Depends of the situation. If he's married, we need a marriage certificate, mm -hmm. legalized, translated. If he has children, we need birth certificates. Um, Mr. Singh also needs a birth certificate for the registration in the municipality. Uh, if he has a partner unmarried, we need declarations of being unmarried, not mm -hmm. older than six months. And if he has a registered partnership, we will need the declaration or... Oh, yeah that he has a registered partnership. You need a lot then. Is that the same? It you really do? depends on the situation. Mm -hmm. It is really, if he's married, we need a marriage certificate. If he's unmarried, having a partner, we will need a declaration of being unmarried. Yeah, but course. all the documents really have to be translated and legalized. Ah, so you can read it in Holland as well. But how is it when you come from the EU and not from India? Well, for EU, EU members, it's really different because if they have uh, a passport or ID card that they are a UN citizen, it, it, they can travel to the Netherlands and they don't have to register themselves. They have to register themselves if they want to live more than four months in the Netherlands okay. because they need the uh, citizen service number. So that means if they register themselves in the municipality where they're going to live, they will automatically get the citizen service number. So that's very important if you want to work in the Netherlands okay. as a EU citizen. Yeah, because as soon as you have that, that so-called what they call here the BSN number, mm -hmm. Uh, with the BSN number, you can also get your health insurance, which is a mandatory deal in the Netherlands, so you have different options. But as soon as you have your BSN number, then you can also uh, enroll for your, for your medical insurance, for yourself, for your family, and that kind of stuff, which is a mandatory deal. And of course, so your startup funds as well. That's, a, that's, a whole, that's a, the whole other part that we deal with, with, with the funding in the markets and the talents, and, and that's a whole other tragic uh, trajectory for, for the business side of it. Yes. And how do they do that? 
Well, as I said, that's that's what the role of as a facilitator. So the facilitator is going to tell them to identify if they come to the analysis. What's the business you're, you're, you're aiming for? What is your target market? Because we can connect you with the right parties in this country. We can target you with the places where you can find the tech talent. We can, play, we can connect you with government agencies or private funding mm. uh, to get your business off the ground. So that's, that's the role of the, of the facilitator. Yeah. So the government is mainly the, all the permitting side and the fiscal side. Uh, the other players, the facilitators, connecting all the players who are involved with getting your access to market, access to talent, access to funding, Perfect, and yeah. access to networks. And how do you get in contact with those investors then through you? Well, the, the, that's, uh, you know, the facilitator is, is his role or her role is uh, the person who is as a spider in the web mm. between all these organizations. So there are multiple, there are literally hundreds of sources for funding and analysis just in the private sphere. Then you get the government with a whole bunch of wonderful tools mm. uh, to help startup companies with early stage funding, with innovation credit, with all kinds of uh, tax credits. Um, so there's a wonderful tools and that's, so the, the facilitator connects all these yeah. parties. So that's what I do as a mentor too. Yes. I tell people, said, okay, I think, that your company is at this stage that you need to look at early stage funding or you need to go to innovation credit or make sure that you're going to apply for a WBSO uh, tax credit for, for tech workers. Uh, so that's that's the role of the facilitator. Okay, and there's a point where you can do a quick scan as well in the government, right? Yes, correct. Yeah, the yeah. RBO is yeah. doing a, yeah, they have an advising part uh, in, in, in this all, in the procedure, that's true. And that's a, that's a very quick way. So it, yeah. it, it looks like there's a lot of work going on there, but, but interesting enough, most of the documents, not all of them, but most of them are all in English. So when you have, for instance, a company coming to you, you're a facilitator for them, and you're going to help them with saying, well, I think at this stage of your company, you should get access to that kind of funding from the government. You can do indeed your quick scan at RVO, the Netherlands Enterprise Agency, within a week. They'll tell you, uh, well, we agree with Mr. Droz, I think you're, you, you qualify for early stage funding or you should do something else. So it's a wonderful tool that you, within a week uh, they'll call you in person and to let you know what the options are. And what if Mr. Singh already works in the Netherlands and he wants to um, do some freelance gigs as well? That is possible. He, can, uh, he has a notification on his residence card that he can work as a highly skilled migrant and a self-employed person. Other labor labor is not uh, allowed, just with a work permit. So, but the most important part is that he always have to fulfill the conditions of the highly skilled migrant scheme. So, um, if, if it is all, if, if he's doing that, that's no problem. He can work as a freelancer oh, perfect. next to his other. Activities. Oh, perfect. Well, thank you so much, thank both you. of you, for all this information. Very helpful. Well, coming to the Netherlands isn't complicated if you know the way. If you're a highly skilled migrant, your employer can help you. If you're a self-employed professional, you can acquire points in a system. And if you want to launch a startup, you can team up with a facilitator. If you want to set up a business in the Netherlands as a foreigner, there are several steps you'll have to take. Also, you need to know about the Dutch market, rules for employers and legal forms. With me are Johan Lafra from the Netherlands Chamber of Commerce and Israeli entrepreneur Avishai Trebelsi, founder and CEO of Quicargo, a business he started in the Netherlands. Welcome to you both, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank Good you. to have you here. Nice to be here. When you came to the Netherlands, you started Quicargo. And what kind of business is Quicargo? I moved here in uh, April th uh, 2016. And Quicargo is a marketplace. It's an online platform that matching empty trucks that uh, running around uh, the roads to any business that needs transportation. OK. Yeah. And was there a gap in the market for filling empty trucks? Uh, for now, we have about 50% of the trucks that you see on the roads are purely uh, empty or even partly empty. Yeah. Oh, wow. So we have a lot of potential to utilize and to improve it commercial-wise, but also it will improve a lot the congestion that we are having and, the, of course, the uh, CO2 and the greenhouse gas. Mm. And how did you come up with this idea? I was managing my family trucking company in, uh, back in Israel 
and I had the same problem. We had a lot of uh, empty trucks and uh, we needed to, uh, and the margin was very low, so we needed to fill the trucks in order to get profit, uh, uh, better margin of the uh, operation. And once I realized it's a big problem, not only in the Israel, I decided to quit and start uh, the global quick cargo. Mm. Yeah. Wow, very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, and if you want to start your business here, what do you need to know and what do you need to take care of? I would always start with myself. Uh, okay. Do I have everything I need to be a successful uh, entrepreneur? Do I have the right skills, the, the right drive, the motivation to make it a success? Am I willing to go all the way for it? I think that's always going to be the first thing. Second thing, um, is to decide if there's a market. Mm. Uh, so you need to take a close look at um, uh, what's the competition like, uh, who are going to be your clients, how many of those are there, and will they eventually end up in a successful business? I think that's, that's going to be step two. Might be something to take a look at if you need some sort of financing. Is there money needed to, to set up? Um, but if that's all taken care of, the only thing that remains is registering at the Chamber of Commerce. And okay. from that point on, you're, you're ready and set to go. And what, if you've done that, what do you need to do next? And when you did all that and you actually have a business, it's time to go out there and uh, start doing the work and, right. and um, start making money. Yeah, I think that's it. And do you need anything else, like from the government, like citizen service numbers? That that's a part uh, in in the, the, the uh, that's also something that you need to take a look at. Um, uh, of course, you need you need to have a tax number. You need to have a VAT number. Uh, in order to do so, you need to be uh, having a, a, a person identification number, mm -hmm. a BSN number. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there are a few things on the side that need to be taken care of as mm -hmm. well. Those are the two important ones. And how did you prepare to enter the Dutch marketplace? It started to not stopping dreaming <laughs> about Wicargo uh, like in the last uh, three years, uh, two and a half years. And then once I took the decision, I sold my house, my car, and I started to invest. So the first point that you mentioned that if you're into, uh, in order to actually realize it, you need to invest a lot in it. Uh, related to that, uh, to that point. The second thing is the market research is mm -hmm. the most important thing. So before uh, we decided to move to the Netherlands, I traveled three uh, months around uh, Europe after uh, analyzing and making research at home, to w who, where are the uh, potential market to start with. And I invested uh, a lot of time by talking with hundreds of companies, experts, uh, logistics, uh, professors in uh, Germany, UK, Poland, here. And eventually, I just asked the, the people and uh, the companies. Uh, I offered my proposition, and then here it was the fastest, uh, the fastest reaction to start. Uh, just let's let's try it, and let, let's see if it's working. And then, uh, yeah, and this is how we started. Yeah. A lot of manual and a lot of call phones, but eventually, from the you first did. client. It started to be where are we now? Yeah. Perfect. And who are your customers? We are targeting mainly a small, uh, micro, small businesses that they're not actually having their own logistic department internally, or they're not having a logistic third, uh, third party logistics that en handling all the logistic flows. And we can actually help them to be much more flexible and also in commercial wise to be. Uh, more uh, in the prices, they're saving uh, transport costs, but they also they have the uh, green impact. That is a small company, it's not your first priority to be mm -hmm. green, but with our system you can actually do it with your uh, right away without investment. Oh, perfect, yeah. Well, you started a business with employees, but you can also start your business as a self-employed person. That's true. And you have different legal forms, and what are those forms? What are the options? Mostly, uh, we see a lot of people registering uh, either a sole proprietorship or a general partnership. And those are both um, looked at as you as an individual, as a person. Um, it's also possible to, to go for a legal form, a legal entity uh, in the Netherlands being a uh, private limited company, also called a BV. Mm. Those are the two, uh, the two that, that end up, we end up with the most. Um, some people uh, use words like freelancing and uh, ZZP, which is mm. also a term very uh, widely used in the Netherlands. Uh, those are no specific legal forms. Uh, when you start 
start as a ZZP or a freelance, you'll either end up with a sole proprietorship or a BV with you as being the, the director shareholder. Okay. And well, how do you choose the legal form that suits you best? That depends on the, the work that you did up front. Um, uh, there are a few differences. Uh, one has to do with taxes. Being a startup business with a low profit expectation might benefit more from a sole proprietorship. Mm -hmm. Uh, on the other hand, there's uh, issues with liability. Uh, if you have um, an activity that in which you are highly liable, uh, high risk, um, it could be uh, to choose for the, the BV instead that has um, a, a limited liability. Mm. And which legal form did you choose and yeah, why? We are in BV and mostly because of uh, our uh, funding comes externally from investors mm. and once they're investing, then they, they must, it's a must uh, have uh, and legal entity as a BV. Yeah. But did also, you, did sorry. your investors get shares? Uh, my apologies. Did your uh, investors get shares uh, in your business? Yeah, they have yeah. equity in yeah. the business, so, so we are partners. Yeah. And when you're a partner, I think it's very important that it's it's easy to share the. I don't know even if you can do in partnership the, no, the share equity. So, so that's that's one, uh, also that's something that you look at. If there are shareholders, multiple mm. shareholders, you need to go with yeah. a, a BV company. Yeah, the course. other one isn't an option. Ah, okay. Mm. And when and how do you register your company? a company at the Netherlands Chamber of Commerce? Uh, depends on the scenario. If you want to set up a, a private limited company, you go to a notary and they'll take care of it, mm -hmm. uh, also with us. So in that case, we don't see you at all. Oh, okay. Um, if you go for a sole proprietorship or a general partnership, uh, you come to our office. You set up an appointment, fill out the paperwork and stop by either alone or with uh, all partners if there's more than one. Mm. Good coffee. <laughs> yeah, you recommend it. <laughs> and what's the right moment to register? Is there a right moment? I would say that um, when you start do, doing the business, if you have clients, if you have turnover coming in, that would be a point of registration. doesn't work like that all the time. At some point, you might to be a little sooner than the, yeah. the actually starting point. Um, in my experience, don't be too soon. Mm. Um, taxes will start and you get a lot of paperwork, which mm. is useless if you, if you didn't start already. But if you need it for whatever reason or there are clients nearby, then you should uh, have yourself registered. And of course, your business needs a trade name. How do you come up with a good one? I wish I knew. You, <laughs> you, you, you really have to, you need to find something. And at, for some, it comes naturally. For another, it needs, it's really work to get a name that, that suits uh, what it is that you're going to do. Um, just keep in mind that you need to be unique. Mm. Um, it cannot be already uh, being used by someone else. It cannot be misleading in any way. Uh, so it needs to be unique. Mm. Um, you'll really need to, to find one yourself. Um, which, which is not confusing as well. Which is not confusing as well, which becomes more and more difficult you know, because we have a lot of businesses uh, in the Netherlands. It's, it's in the millions now. Um, so try to find something that isn't already out there. Mm. That, that's uh, that's going to be a difficult process. But still, um, you need to find one. And uh, if it's not going to work for just you, and uh, ask your family, your friends, uh, the people around you who know who you are, who know what, uh, what you're about to do, mm. and um, that might end up with, with some good ideas from other people. Mm. Uh, things that also need to be considered is if you want to, to have, let's say, a website for mm -hmm. your business, uh, it also needs to be a name that uh, is still available as a domain name. Oh, yeah. And also uh, is something to check is whether you're... Uh, uh, trade name is already being registered somewhere as yeah. a brand name. Yeah. If that's the case, you can not use it as well. Oh, of course. And yeah, how did yeah, you come important. up with your name? Yeah, I used the, my network and my friends, family and creative, uh, the most creative people I knew, mm -hmm. to uh, think about three aspects. The first thing, it needs to be uh, easy to, to pronounce because you don't say a very difficult one. The second thing, it needs to be international if it's your intention. It's very important. I see a lot of companies with very domestic uh, names, and yeah. it's very difficult to pronounce, and they absolutely need to change the, the name when they go global, and we're all going global, of course. Yes. And, <laughs> and the third thing is need to uh, expand the values uh, that you're trying to, uh, to uh, propose to, to your audience. So this is how we came with the name, Quick Cargo. And then it's quick and easy and in very easy to, to book a shipment. Ah. 
So this is how we did. And one comment here, the company entity, the, the legal entity, it can be a different name than the brand name. Oh, yes. So it's important to, to be, a, it's more, it gives you more flexibility. Okay. And I'm wondering, do you need any qualifications, permits or certificates to start a business in the Netherlands? Not actually the starting itself. Uh, starting itself is for us to, to have you come by and, and register the business. Uh, we're not going to ask you for any paperwork at that point. But there are some specific areas in which you still need um, uh, permits. Mm -hmm. um, uh, transport for one is, is uh, well known and um, also if you want to start or uh, establishment. Mm. There are also rules and regulations there. Um, uh, but it's not going to be something that we're going to ask you for when you come for registration itself. But for certain areas, certain professions, there are some uh, things that you need to, to have in order to be able to, to, to do the activity itself. Okay. And you have employees. Do you have Dutch employees or foreign employees or both maybe? Yeah, we're an international team. 80% are Dutch. Uh, and the rest are uh, from uh, Israel, United States, Brazil. We, we relocate people from all over the, the world in order to uh, realize a quick cargo. And uh, yeah, so Very it's international. It's, international. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's important vibes uh, to keep. Well, nice. And can you actually run a business from your home address? That depends on the activity. Uh, some you can and some you can't. Um, if it's just going to be you at home at your laptop doing some consulting, that's fine uh, to do from home. If you were to start, uh, let's say, a very bad example, but if you were to sell a fireworks, um, mm -hmm. the storage at home might not be the, not the so smart safe. thing to do. No. So in, in the experience, it depends on the activity that you have. Um, in some cases, it's allowed. In other cases, it's prohibited. If you want to know for sure, you can check with the municipality to, to find out if there are any specific limitations. Okay, and how do you minimize risks? Be careful with what you do. Mm. I think that's the, the first step. Um, changing the legal form might help. Going from sole proprietorship to a BV, that could limit your risks uh, yeah. hugely. <laughs> um, but also think of insurances, uh, terms and uh, conditions. Mm. Um, set up good agreements between you and the, the, the entity that you work with. Um, that limits your risks uh, perfectly, I think. Mm. And maybe pension as well? That's if you want to have some sort of pension when you get old, then yeah, you should set up something for that as well. Same goes for insurances, insurances for sickness and health. Um, yeah, if you want to have something, if you can become work invalid, um, that might be wise to have something set up for that. Mm. And how did you set up your network here in the Netherlands? Network. I uh, started to uh, call. Pick <laughs> <laughs> up the phone. I just picked up the phone with uh, my uh, special uh, accent and uh, tried to... Uh, Introduce myself and the business and where I'm coming from and why it's important for me to realize it and why I chose the Netherlands. And after a couple of, maybe not hundreds, but tens of calls, uh, I got the first client. And from that moment, uh, we got more and more. Now we have uh, nearly thousands of businesses already registered. Wow. That's so, yeah. yeah. And did you visit any events or...? Yeah, we 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 created uh, we created our uh, brand. We put the names in the in the events. We also tried to find the most influenced people in our industry, and we approached them a couple of times. Let's say <laughs> until they they agreed to to hear us. And I think what we're trying to do is also uh, important for the environment and but also the commercial. So it's win win win. Mm. So a lot of uh, people including the government supporting uh, in such a project. So it's, it was easy for us to, to promote a positive impact mm. and not something that purely business and commercial, I think. Yeah. And do you have any tips for other entrepreneurs who want to start their business oh, here? Oh, many, many. <laughs> yes? <laughs> but I think it's also... Top three, please. <laughs> uh, it's important to... to yeah, you, you, even you, you're, you have a lean budget, it's important not to save in matter of uh, all these uh, administration things and to, to know exactly what are the rules in order not to miss. So you take a good lawyer, a good mm. accountant, a good, make sure that you have the right insurance because we're 
getting a lot of information, for instance, and privacy and things that you need to make sure uh, you can provide those services. So don't, don't try to do everything by yourself. You focus on your business mm. and let an uh, expert and maybe people of uh, local uh, companies that are helping uh, experts uh, to come here and, and, and to uh, make it more easy and faster and more safe. Oh, very good. Yeah. And do you have any additional tips? I think you mentioned uh, the, the most important ones. Uh, get help whenever you need it. Um, so come to us, come to the tax office, hire an accountant. Uh, try to get people close by who can help you with uh, certain areas of expertise. That really helps uh, a lot. And uh, get out there and talk to people and, and, and tell them that you exist. Tell them what it is that you do and, and uh, go from there. So go out. Very I good. want to add one, one more thing. Oh, so, so in my experience from different countries, I think it's good for uh, another tip. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, here, my, in my experience, the authorities and the uh, chambers of commerce, but even uh, the uh, RVO and different uh, uh, parties were very accessible, so it wasn't difficult to approach and ask mm -hmm. questions. In my perspective in the past, so when you talk about a governmental party, or it's very difficult, it's not really accessible. Mm -hmm. So there are, ask your questions and put it on the table, and sometimes you'll be surprised you're gonna get quite uh, efficient uh, answers. So this is That's important to, to try, because I think the first thing, government, no, it's too difficult to approach. But, but it's not. Apparently not, well, in my experience, at least, so, no. Good to know, well, thank yeah. you. Gentlemen, so much for all the information. Thank you, cool. Thank you very much. <laughs> Starting a business requires a number of steps and key decisions. Once you have decided upon your business legal form, you can have your enterprise registered at the local Chamber of Commerce. Whether you offer services or products, you will do so at your own risk expense and with full responsibility towards third parties. Preparing well is the best way to start. The Dutch Chamber of Commerce provide information on starting a business. You are definitely not on your own. Plenty of competent assistance is to be found in the Netherlands business world. Everyone living, working or running a business in the Netherlands has to pay taxes. What types of taxes do businesses in the Netherlands have to deal with? And can entrepreneurs benefit from tax deductions or allowances? I will be discussing this with Ian van Haren from the Dutch Tax and Customs Administration and with Israeli entrepreneur Avishai Trebelsi, founder and CEO of Qui Cargo, who set up his company in the Netherlands. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Good to have you here. Well, Ian, I would like to start with you. Um, what kind of taxes do you have to well, keep in mind when you want to start up your company here in the Netherlands? Uh, well, if you move to the Netherlands, you will be dealing with um, um, uh, VAT, um, income tax, corporate income tax, wage taxes. It all depends on the classification of your income and what it is exactly that you do. Um, and how did you prepare yourself for taxes, Avishai? Yeah, when the first thing I moved here and then uh, I hired the accountant mm -hmm. in order to avoid any uh, uh, things that I, I, I don't know. So it's for me, it's a foreign country and I needed to uh, figure everything out. So it's always easier to do it with the accountant. So it was quite uh, easy, but the process itself was uh, not, not so difficult for us in the first uh, stage. Because you had your accountant, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you could afford one, but not everyone is that lucky. So, how does it actually work with wage taxes, Ian? Yeah, so um, wage taxes. Uh, if you have uh, an employees uh, in your business, then you will have to uh, keep a wage tax administration, and you have to withhold wage taxes. And well, two things I want to mention about that is, um, of course, when you um, when you own five more than five percent of the shares in your company. Uh, then you also will have to withhold wage taxes if you are working for your own company. Um, that is rather important, so the customary wage tax rule. Um, and the other thing I want to mention is there um, the 30% ruling. Uh, if, you, um, um, if you have any employees with special skills that come from outside the Netherlands, then um, they can deduct up to 30% of their uh, income um, to make up for the costs of relocation. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, well, generally considered rather favorable uh, uh, scheme. Uh, 
Mm. And what do you think of that 30%? Yeah, I think that's one of the most uh, important for us to come uh, uh, and also for my employers. Now I have five people that so came from Israel, from Brazil, from America, from different uh, areas. And we all got, including me, the 30%. It's really helping us especially due to the fact that we are a lean startup, so the salaries is not very high. So uh, we get more in the net uh, end of the month, and it's super important for us. So good job in that. <laughs> <laughs> and how does it work if you're a sole propriety business owner? Yeah, so the, the one-man business um, is uh, taxed uh, in income uh, in income tax, uh, uh, as opposed to if you um, yeah you know, if you have a company, then you're really dealing with corporate income tax. And um, well, generally. Uh, uh, depending on your size, it, it, it's usually when you get any bigger, then it's more. Imp then you probably will move more to the corporate income tax side. But for the uh, the one-man business, will always be taxed in the income tax, um, and uh, you will be taxed on your business profits. So that is the um, um, you know, your uh, income earned and minus any and expenses incurred for uh, equipment, uh, travel expenses, as well the like. Um. Okay. How does it work in the first year? Ah, that's a good question. In the first year, um, uh, you cannot uh, file your income tax uh, return digitally. So uh, usually you file it uh, via the internet. Um, you get a login, a login code, and you can um, uh, uh, fill in your return. But in the in the first year, that doesn't work yet. So um, we need to know some extra stuff of you, uh, some extra things of you. Um, and uh, then you get this paper form. It's called the M form. You can uh, order it via the phone, and uh, well, you have to fill it out. And you get old school paper. Old school paper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, uh, and the other thing that's important in the first year is that you get to choose whether you want to be um, uh, considered um, a, a resident taxpayer for the entire year or not. And that can be advantageous for things like uh, mortgage interest deduction and other deductions. Um, so you can you can uh, take advantage of them for the entire year. Yeah. And how was your experience with that? Again, thanks to... <laughs> <laughs> no, we had, I remember those uh, files, but it's, it's, again, it's not so bad. It's, it's manually, but still it's uh, reasonably fine in order to get uh, to get to know. Uh, they need to know us, of course, and all the history and when we came and all the... Especially if, you're, if uh, for instance, in Israel, uh, we are working together in Germany in matter of tax, so... Now I need to uh, claim that I moved here, mm -hmm. so the, the process, we're still in the process, but it, it's, it's okay. So it's something that, it's not new for the, for the authorities, so I think it's already quite, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's okay, so okay, yeah. no problem. <laughs> <laughs> nice, so, nice to hear. Yeah. <laughs> so you told us quite a lot already, so how could you summarize, how do you calculate the amount of taxes due? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, the income tax is calculated on the business profits uh, earned, uh, so that's just the uh, the total uh, turnover minus any uh, costs incurred for equipment, expenses, travel. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the Netherlands allows entrepreneurs a number of tax deductions, and um, such as the entrepreneur's deduction. How does that work? Uh, well, if you meet the criteria to be uh, considered a real entrepreneur, uh, then you uh, get some rather favorable deductions, uh, which can considerably lower the amount of taxes due in the end. Uh, Okay, and how does that work in practice? Uh, well, um, the most uh, important criteria is that you're uh, independent uh, and that you run some real entrepreneurial risk. So um, that you run the risk that uh, your uh, customers' um, uh, customer stream will dry up and that you have uh, the risk of non-paying customers. Um, so if you run those risks, then you're considered a real entrepreneur and then you can apply for these deductions. Okay. Uh, so when I qualify as an entrepreneur, uh, which benefits can I expect? Uh, so if you meet the criteria we discussed, um, firstly, uh, there's the uh, profit exemption of 14% for small and medium-sized enterprises. It's called an exemption, but you can just deduct 14% of, um, of your profits. Uh, and then there's the investment allowance that allows you to deduct up to 28% of your uh, profits uh, for investments you made. Uh, um, and um, there's also a special investment allowance for environmentally friendly uh, assets such as electric cars. Uh, if you work for uh, at least 1,225 hours yeah. uh, a year in your business, so at least uh, 25 hours uh, a week, 
uh, in that case, there are the two extra um, uh, allowances, um, mm. deductions that can be made. Uh, the first is uh, that you can uh, have the um, self-employment uh, deduction. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a lot of big one. It's about uh, 7,200 euros a year. Mm -hmm. um, and if you just started your company, you can uh, deduct uh, up to uh, 2,100 euros. Um, very so good. Very great amount to, to be able to deduct. Yeah. And uh, when do you actually qualify as an entrepreneur for the value added tax purposes? Yeah. Well, uh, well uh, interestingly, um, it's possible that you will not be considered uh, an entrepreneur for income tax purposes, but you will be uh, considered an entrepreneur for VAT purposes. So the threshold is much lower for VAT purposes. Okay. Um, and, and what is that threshold? Uh, so um, uh, anywhere uh, you um, um, provide any goods or services at uh, a consideration, uh, you are considered uh, a VAT entrepreneur. And that's a lot uh, quickly. Uh, Okay, and how, how does that work here in the Netherlands? Uh, so, uh, the, um, the VAT system is uh, the same as uh, um, the one which is in place in all other EU member states. Mm -hmm. um, uh, basically, if you're an entrepreneur and you provide goods and services at a consideration, you, are, um, you should invoice uh, VAT uh, to your customers. Uh, uh, of course, any uh, input VAT, so a VAT that you... Uh, that you pay to other uh, uh, entrepreneurs is deductible as long as it is attributable to um, a taxable output. Um. Yeah, and how? what's the rate in the Netherlands? Uh, so uh, we have three rates. Uh, the 21 is the, the base rate, then there's a 6% rate for food products, uh, sports services, medicine, books. And then there's a zero rate for any exports. Uh, so uh, if you export goods, then you don't have to charge any goods, any uh, VAT on the goods, but you get to deduct all the input VAT. So that's sort of the best of both worlds. Uh. Mm. Perfect. Are there exemptions? Uh, yeah, a uh, number of exemptions apply, for instance, for uh, educational, uh, for ser mostly for services, educational, medical, uh, cultural. When, you're, uh, when the service that you provide as an entrepreneur is exempt, uh, any um, input taxes, uh, input VAT that is uh, attributable to those, um, to those goods and services is not uh, deductible. Uh, you, you can find uh, more uh, information uh, about uh, our tariffs on uh, the website uh, business.gov.nl. Good to know. And well, more practical, mm. when and how should you file your VAT return? Oh, yeah. So, uh, VAT returns are usually filed uh, every quarter. There are some exceptions apply, but uh, usually it's well every quarter. Uh, you find them also digitally via the website of the, um, of the tax authorities. Uh, there's this quite a simple form which you uh, have to fill out. And what if you forget or you don't file it or maybe a bit too late? What happens then? Ah, that's a good question. So, uh, the, uh, the VAT system is uh, totally automated. So, um, the assessments are uh, handled digitally and uh, automated. So if you uh, miss uh, a term or uh, don't file anything, then uh, the system automatically uh, files any uh, um, additional assessments, but also fines. Uh, so that can be a bit of a problem. So it's really important that you always uh, file uh, your VAT return on time and, uh, and also pay it within uh, the time mm. uh, that is uh, set for it. And what does that mean for your administration? What do you need to do? So it's important that you, uh, any business should have a good uh, financial administration. Uh, of course, uh, you should know if you have any profits or losses. Uh, and the same information is also used um, for the revenue service uh, to base your VAT return on and also your income tax returns. Uh, uh, yeah. I, can, I can give an example. For instance, in Israel, I also paid I my own businesses back then. Mm -hmm. And here it's more... Uh, I'm, uh, like it's easy because we're using a software to uh, to detect all the uh, VAT returns and the VAT payable. So, mm -hmm. you know, we do it months to months because for us it's also important to get the uh, cash flow in the same in the same way we are working. So we can yeah, it's qu we started quarterly, but since now we are growing, so we, we made it uh, months to months. Oh. It's easier for us to okay, great to get the VAT return. What are the minimal requirements for a financial administration? Uh, so there are no really hard rules uh, for what uh, administration should contain. Uh, it should be tailored to the business. Uh, uh, it's 
Well, most important is that it is uh, quickly accessible for the tax authorities, um, that is verifiably correct, uh, and that it is uh, well kept for a long enough time. So you have to uh, keep uh, all documents that are generated within the business, uh, digitally or on paper, for at least seven years. Um, any documents that pertain to um, uh, real estate should be kept for at least 10 years. Oh, wow. My last question is, um, are you obliged to give a receipt to your customers with every transaction you make? Uh, so, uh, no, um, not in, in, in some EU countries that is the case, but in Netherlands you don't have to um, um, uh, well, send an invoice in every time. Only if you uh, invoice to other um, uh, entrepreneurs, you, you're obliged to have an, uh, an invoice. But if, you, uh, uh, have some, uh, if your clients are uh, private persons, th there's no need uh, okay. to... Uh, Give an invoice with it. Uh, of course, if you do uh, uh, send out an invoice to your uh, to private persons, you have to keep it in your administration. Uh, yeah. So you know what you've done, of course. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, thank you very much for this talk. Well, very interesting, and I think very helpful for everyone who's watching. So, um, as an entrepreneur, you can benefit from different tax deductions or allowances. Keep track of your records and your hours right from the start. That is the only way to benefit from tax schemes. Seeking professional advice from an accountant is usually a good idea. If you want to do business in Europe, the Netherlands is a good starting point. It's located in the heart of mainland Europe and has an excellent infrastructure. Also, the business climate in the Netherlands is reliable, strong and internationally focused. Everyone speaks English. All in all, a first-class country to start your business. Let's hear what foreign entrepreneurs have to say about the Netherlands and Dutch people. So setting up a business in the Netherlands or putting in place a company in the Netherlands is quite easy. So there's no um, massive capital requirements, uh, corporate governance structure is quite flexible and simple so you can easily tailor the group structure to your needs. Entrepreneurial, vibrant, energizing, get things done, open-minded, in your face, cozy, gezellig is actually the word, talent, uh, it's about inclusivity, cool and progressive, Global, a global city. Well connected. Welcome, gentlemen. Good to have you here. Good to be here. <laughs> um, why did you start your business, Quicargo, here in the Netherlands? We're a logistic platform, and logistic is, uh, I can call the Netherlands the heaven of logistic. Okay. Because of the harbor, you have the uh, Schiphol, you have Rotterdam, and Venlo is a logistic big hack, so it's very good for our business. And the second thing is quite a small ecosystem, and we can do uh, smaller mistakes, and we can learn quite fast uh, uh, from our uh, performance and from our uh, new uh, early adapters uh, clients. So it was a very uh, smart uh, decision from our side. Now I can see it, can tell it after one and a half year. Uh, and this is the main reason. So it's a good starting point because you can test drive in a way? Yes, exactly. So uh, business-wise, uh, our uh, logistics sector is very strong uh, uh, and centralized point in, the, in Europe. And, and also the expand. ecosystem itself as a, as a business perspective in a matter of uh, uh, easy to get feedback from the market right away. This is the most important thing in, in, in when you start a business to make sure that you're uh, selling something that actually people need. So and after that, you want to expand to the rest of Europe, correct. right? Yeah. 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 Okay. And uh, Willem, um, you work for Startup Delta. Mm -hmm. And how does Startup Delta help startups? Well, when they come to the, to the country here, yeah, for instance, like uh, Avishai that I have worked with as a mentor, um, they come to the country and, and going to establish themselves, trying to find out how to take maximum advantage of Holland as the best place to start and grow and internationalize your business. So we're not only looking at the piece of how you're going to establish yourselves nationally in, in looking for funding, looking for network partners, 
put them in, 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 into contact with his right uh, customers, but also looking at going across the border. So Avishai's company, Quick Cargo, is going to move, uh, come with us uh, next month to Hanover Mess in Germany to start developing the German market. And so we're only not, not looking at, at Holland as an own country. Mm. Uh, we're also looking at, as we say, as the best platform in Europe to develop your business Europe, your, on a European scale. And uh, so that's another major, major purpose of uh, Startup Delta. Okay. And can you tell us something about the Dutch infrastructure? Well, Dutch infrastructure is not, not just uh, the logistical part that Avishai is talking about, the, the roads, the harbors, and the kind of stuff that's particularly uh, very important for his business. If you're a pure tech startup, uh, a very important part is also uh, the whole uh, in, uh, uh, technological infrastructure. Amsterdam is the largest uh, internet uh, uh, network uh, point here in Western Europe, and that's why you have billions of dollars of data centers being built by big companies like Microsoft and Google in the Netherlands. So. Uh, that very, very, uh, very good infrastructure, technological infrastructure, IT infrastructure, is very important as as a tool to attract foreign companies in, in the technological field. Okay. Do you agree? Yeah, I absolutely agree. But also one thing that uh, we, we didn't discuss: people like uh, if if you're an uh, IT company, you need to uh, hire uh, high skill. Uh, developers and mm -hmm. it's easy to convince Brazilian uh, developers to join to uh, to come over to Amsterdam. Oh, really? Yes, it's yep. super uh, uh, yep. nice for them, and so it's well branded uh, uh, country and city to uh, come over. And it's super important in the IT business because sure. there is a, a big lack of uh, developers anywhere. And that's, that's a very important point. But it's true. It's, it's, I mean, it's, 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 I see that every day. And there's companies from all over the world coming to this country. Young people, they really are attracted by the quality yeah. of life in Holland. And Ivisha is, is experiencing that, not because they only speak Dutch. It's, it's, it's the whole mentality, the culture. It's also the creativity yeah. that they have here, the very international orientation. Ah. Everybody feels themselves home here very easily. And you see this in the business climate as well, this sure. international focus. Oh, of course. I mean, this, this is our tradition, and for hundreds of years has been that outward focus. And so what you see right now, first we had hundreds of, of large multinationals choosing Holland as a starting point for operating in Europe. Uh, now you see a sort of a next wave in the day of, of the days of, of technology. You see all these young tech companies coming to countries not only because of the infrastructure, but also because of the quality of living that they find here, and it's, and it's international orientation, because tech business is a global business, and Holland is a very good sp spot to tap into the global business. Okay, yeah. and how would you describe the Dutch people? <laughs> <laughs> Be honest. <laughs> how honest? No, just kidding. Business perspective, uh, I was very uh, happy to see that they're really open-minded to uh, innovation, sustain sustainability. So this is one of the main uh, uh, focus we are uh, targeting. And they're actually willing to try. And you don't need to come with a lot of track rec record. And as a startup, you don't have anything. So mm -hmm. we just called, yeah, you're my first client. You want to try and try it in other countries. So, so here, apparently, <laughs> yeah. it's worked. So that's very important if you're starting, uh, especially if it's something that's new uh, to the market. Okay. And what's and it like to do business with them? Why? No, or, what's it like to do business with them? Yeah, I think people? it's quite direct. So the negotiation is also uh, good fun, but I think that Israel is, uh, we're also okay with that. So I think it's good, good uh, match. Uh, good match <laughs> in matter of uh, uh, negotiations and trading and, and uh, very open international-wise as well. Uh, English is very important because mm. sometimes you can lose things in, in language and you can cover it by, by the good uh, uh, language you can, we can have it here. And once you've done an agreement, which is not easy, but once you've got one, it's actually happening. And it's not so obvious. If you do in other areas in, in the world, mm -hmm. you can sign the contract, but the execution is totally different. And surprisingly, really, uh, this is a very important uh, part. We can focus on our business because actually the ecosystem and the business is also uh, respecting ah, the, yes. the, the deal. So it's so they're then, reliable when yeah, they pay on time. Exactly. So yeah. all these things, it's happening. And that's let us focus and on the innovation or the uh, the growth instead of uh, administration and all these annoying things that you need to deal mm. as a small company. So, so that's yeah. Yeah. So business-wise, it's nice to work with yeah. them. But how are they on a private basis? 
<laughs> no, no. You can still be Just honest. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm purely honest. Uh, it's uh, yeah. So one thing when I, I'm, I'm working hard, a lot of hours uh, per week or even weekends. But once I got my uh, free time, mm -hmm. I don't like to plan. Mm. I just take, like to do anything that I want now and just to relax. And if I'm, I got some uh, Dutch friends and I need to book one month in advance oh, yes, to drink happens. coffee or beer. Yeah. <laughs> if, yeah, so that's, that's one thing that uh, it's, I'm still catching up, trying to uh, schedule uh, my, my uh, private agenda as well. But yeah, instead of that, it's very open and uh, I think I know Amsterdam, and for me it's a very big uh, international community. So I have friends from all over the world. It's, mm. it's quite easy, and I think it's not uh, too difficult for the Dutch, the local uh, community, to to integrate because I think it's al already many years uh, this combination. So I think it's yeah. It's but do you speak Dutch? No. <laughs> I'm trying. That's, I'm trying. And I'm, uh, every Saturday, I'm cancelling, unfortunately, my my courses. But um, yeah, everyone speak uh, perfect English, so it's very difficult. In the negative side, it's difficult for me to to uh, to learn. But in the positive side, it's easy communication. So I'm still working on it, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah that's really a practice. A lot of you know, that's the practice. I, I hear that all the time, and I hear from in Holland for like for two years. I said, when did you finally? Going to learn some Dutch, <laughs> and I said I'll try to. But as soon as I try, they start speaking English to me. I can never practice. Yeah, well. But anyways, so the other thing that uh, further to what uh, Avishai is saying is Holland is a perfect place to start and grow and internationalize mm. your business. Not only do they learn to operate in a very international organization uh, oper uh, environment, but we also, as we as we go into experience in Germany, even the large German companies love to work do with you Dutch speak startups. German as well. Sure, sure, sure. And so, so they love to work with, with Dutch startups because they are so creative. You know, the Germans will think it through too long before something is going to materialize. So the Dutch are much, much quicker on the feet and much more creative. And, and so they learn that in Holland as well, and because that has been the tradition here. Creativity, trying out things, it's a, it's a merchant mentality to mm. try things out rather than engineer it to the end. And, and never get anything accomplished. And so this whole environment of being creative and quick on your feet and trying to find new innovative ways of, of doing stuff is not only good for operating well in Holland, but you can also use that capacity to go to France, to go to Germany, countries where they are more engineering organized, where they're very strict, very regimental, and, and, and work in a more open kind of a thinking way of operating. And that's really critical in the, in the, in the world of technology. Yeah. And they speak French as well, they're German, English, French? Uh, well, I well, used to, but uh, I, ca I can brush it up but, uh, if necessary, but sure. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's very important, it's one of the things that, that people learn here too, that Yes, it's all Europe, but it's still very distinct mm. business climates. German, uh, Germany has a very different uh, business climate than France has, and you really need to adapt to it. Mm. I think the Dutch are used to it because, you know, 70% of what we produce is going across the border. So everybody's used to these different business climates. That's also what you learn. So if you have an American company here, they really learn that, that it's not so easy. What, you, what works in Holland doesn't necessarily work in Germany mm. or in France. Yeah. So people learn how to adapt to these different different climates, business climates. Okay, and also it's very handy that they're multilingual. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And um, how easy is it to start a business in the Netherlands compared to other EU companies? Uh, Actually, countries? way way easier. Uh, I would say the UK would be slightly easier, but it's also a way of learning the UA around here. So once you know the channel, that's why that the orange carpet is so important, because people in our network tell you how to do that, not only help you what is the right, the, the right legal form from a business, but also how you're going to buy it about it. And I said, we could do it online, we'll help you with it. And um, so the analysis is actually when you put all the pieces together, and when you use the the orange carpet route, you'll find out that it is surprisingly easy, way quicker than starting a company in Germany or France. So, Afishai, did the Netherlands really roll out the orange carpet for you? Absolutely. It was, uh, first, of course, it's a very important uh, tip, let's say. 
ask questions and try to understand the ecosystem before you're starting the uh, task one by one. So try to understand what you can get from the uh, parties that are involved in the, uh, uh, the uh, let's call it uh, soft uh, landing mm -hmm. in the Netherlands. And once you know who is doing what, and maybe it's easy to, to ask, uh, like start the bootcamp or any other uh, accelerator that's available, who are the parties, and once you know, it will be very, uh, uh, it's, it's quite easy to get the information and help them to get the help to, uh, to process it. So yes, it's good. One, one thing to improve <laughs> is the, uh, we, I didn't know about those uh, parties that involved, uh, only after I asked questions. So maybe you can do the uh, marketing, or at least the, uh, to make it more accessible for really people that are just coming and and starting to ask the question somehow to get it uh, right away, and then it will save a lot of time for them and yeah. effort. Yeah. Okay, well, that's a good idea. Hmm? Well, thank you both for all your information and for being You're here. Welcome. Well, it's fair to conclude that the Netherlands have a lot to offer to entrepreneurs who want to start, roll out, and expand their business here. The Netherlands offers you a high quality work environment and an excellent infrastructure with an internationally oriented English speaking population. And as Afishai mentioned, the Netherlands roll out the orange carpet for you as an entrepreneur. Good luck with your business. We have come to the end of this webinar. Do you still have questions? The live chat will stay online for another 30 minutes, so don't hesitate to use it. If you want to watch the webinar again or share it, it will be available on business.gov.nl starting from tomorrow. We hope you'll take the time to complete the online evaluation form. We value your feedback and will use your input for our next webinar. To complete the form, please click the button below the video screen. For more information, please visit business.gov.nl.